beasts and beekeepers. Um, on our first slide, you can see we are, well, this meeting is actually our rescheduled meeting from Houston Snow Week. I hope each of you has recovered and um, your bees are thriving. Um, on slide two, you'll see that we have a full agenda today and um, have an amazing speaker with us today, Tammy Horn, who's going to be discussing bees in America. As usual, we will also have a couple quick announcements and then open it up after Tammy's presentation for a quick question and answer se session, as well as end with our door prizes. On slide three, you can see HBA membership is open again. If you remember, our membership is from January to December. So I know we've sent out a couple of notices this last week to remind everyone to go ahead and up their membership for 2021. Again, this is a, a priceless uh, package um, so that you can visit with us uh, the third Tuesday of every month and have great speakers also get access to the SCEP and a community of bee neighbors and then um, also access to equipment rentals for things like extractors and, um, and other bee equipment that you might not otherwise uh, want to purchase on your own. It's a great benefit. On slide four, just a reminder, we have a new board this year. Um, again, I'm continuing on as president and Joe Powers, <laughs> as vice president, and then uh, Laura Mullen as treasurer and Kyle Wolf as secretary. Your team is on the phone today um, and here to support you guys if you run into any questions on membership or the club. So with that, I actually want to go ahead and turn it over on slide five to Tammy Horn. Um, if I could see you guys, I'm also having some technical difficulties. I would show you my book, Tammy, that I have. <laughs> this is Bees in America, um, How the Honeybee Shaped a Nation. We're so excited to have her today. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Tammy, and Joe to drive the slides. All right. Okay. <laughs> this has been a team effort tonight. Um, I want to thank my husband. I don't know what he did to manage to, to let me join you by person, uh, um, but somehow he, he made it work. Um, Joe, I want to thank Joe for, first of all, inviting me, but also then for agreeing to um, show these slides. And, um, and for some reason now, I have lost the screen, so I don't know. I'm assuming that we're starting with the, the title slide of the book. Let me, get my, let me get your slides up, Tammy. I don't have them up right this second. Okay, okay, good. Then it's not just me. Okay, title slides up. Let's see if I can, I'm not sharing my screen yet. Let me get back to that. Let's see, I have to. Okay. Hold on, here I go. Screen, there we go. Okay, this screen right here. Share, and there you go. Everybody's got it now. Okay, so I'm probably not your typical speaker in that, um, especially with this book, because when I wrote the book, I didn't want to write a how-to manual. I, I thought that there were very good texts out there already. And I wanted to do something that was more um, of a cultural history and a social history. So I, I like to make sure that I, I tell people this up front so that they're not disappointed if in fact they don't get as many how-to beekeeping skills as they would normally get in, in a talk of this of this fashion, uh, but but what I did do uh, was to me at this point in time in my life, it's been neat for me to remember the person I was when I was writing this because I will I will be upfront. I was a horrible beekeeper when I wrote this book. 
Um, and what I was really interested was in how bees had shaped the way that we look at our society and how we use these to shape our cultural values. Um, so with that being said, let's move to the second slide, Joe. And while he's doing that, I'll just say that the, that the cover art for this book uh, was in fact um, a, a needlepoint print that we received permission uh, to use on the cover. Uh, I, I get asked about that cover a lot and uh, it was from the 19th century and uh, the <clears throat> Colonial Williamsburg loaned that to me so that we could use the image for the book. And, and honestly, I believe that that image has helped put the book in people's hands more so than anything else. Um, I think people fall in love with that image as, as I did. And so the thesis for the book was, is basically looking at how social values were, were and remain heavily influenced by 17th and 18th century English ideas about beehives. And I will be talking about analogies uh, in this presentation. Uh, the most important analogy being that our human society is a lot like a hive of bees. And for those who are history nut nuts, I noticed that somebody in the chat room self-identified. Um, the woman that I list here as my resource at the bottom of the page uh, is, is just must reading. It is absolutely just one of the best articles that talks about how pervasive the beehive and the skep were uh, among English politicians as they were trying to deal with um, displaced people as, as the English society transitioned from a feudal society uh, to a more industrial one. Of course, people were being displaced all the time and you had politicians really kind of not knowing what to do. So they looked to the beehive to help them deal with overpopulation. And, and so this book, um, Karen O'Dell Cooperman's article there is a really good uh, article to, to follow up this discussion if you like things like this. Okay, let's go to slide three. So I thought first, I mean, it may have been a while since you've had a logic class or a law class. So maybe it's been a while since you've heard the terminology and I thought maybe it would help if we're all on the same page. You know, an analogy is a simple comparison between two unlike things using like or as to simplify complex situations. Now, <clears throat> I may be dating myself here, but in 1994, Forrest Gump came out and it was a hugely successful movie. Um, and, and it revolved around this analogy that life is like a box of chocolates. Now I can't say it, <clears throat> Even though I lived in Alabama for eight years, I don't have um, I don't have Tom Hanks' ability to 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 say that like he did. Uh, and if we were in a in a classroom, we would talk about this. Um, you know that life is about trying new things and sometimes not liking what you chose to take a bite of. You know, and maybe putting it back and or maybe trying something and loving it. And you know you keep eating chocolates then um you know there's a lot of ways that this, this is like but you know the the analogy works because uh i think many of us first of all enjoy uh the gift not just the gift of a box of chocolates but the gift of life and so I, for a whole generation of people you know uh forrest gump and this analogy that it hinges around um really shaped how we approached things. And so that's a simple one. Let's move on to another one, one that's quite current. Uh, so right now you may hear of the fact that our economy is in a K-shaped recovery, um, you know, which is a, a phrase that uh, an analogy that Dr. Peter Atwater at the College of William and Mary has used to describe why some people are doing great. Um, 
people who do house appraisals right now are making quite a bit of money, whereas some people in this economy are really struggling. Gym owners, for instance, or restaurant owners are really struggling right now. Um, so this is an example of an analogy that you're hearing a lot. And it's a way of helping give us an image to, to wrap our minds around what we're going through as a society. Um, so, so those are two kind of general analogies. So now let's turn to B analogies. If Joe, if you'd be so kind as to move forward. So analogies related to honeybees are everywhere. We all know them, we use them, I use them. Um, you know, one of the more pervasive ones is that we should be busy as a bee. Um, you know, the, the idea that we're worker bees um, and that implied in that is that if we are working like a bee or if we are a worker bee, that somehow there'll be rewards, there'll be financial rewards. And in the hive, we see that in the accumulation of honey. Um, or the accumulation of beeswax. Um, of course, in our world, we are looking for the accumulation of money and, and funds, savings accounts. Um, maybe it's our uh, land holdings or the, the size of house that we own. You know, we expect that there's this link, a direct causation, you know, that if somebody works really hard, you know, then, then in fact, there will be some of these um, monetary rewards. Um, but let's move on to the next slide. Sometimes, you know, obviously, as you know, I mean, people can be busy as bees. Um, you know, when I was in grad school, I had three jobs, um, but they were very, um, they weren't, good paying jobs, you know, they were minimum wage jobs and things. And so I was still always seemed like I was just kind of getting by while I was in graduate school, finishing my doctorate. Um, and so another drone that we, I mean, another analogy that we tend to use is um, this image of a drone. And the back in the 17th century, I mean, it was widely assumed that drones were lazy and they just didn't do anything. And, and we still joke about this all the time. I mean, you know, our bee vendors make quite a bit of money off of t-shirts. Um, and when I got married to my husband, my, the, the same man who was helping get me on this um, Zoom meeting tonight, I mean, I got all kinds of shirts where he's being called a lazy drone. And, um, but that's, it really belies more complex issues. And especially in the 17th century, when English colonists were setting up Jamestown, Jamestown is really where this image of a drone came to be used in a punitive fashion. And some of it was just simply because the conditions that the colonists faced were so harsh. Um, you know, I mean, half of the, the colonists, you know, came, became very ill or sick, if not, if they didn't die. And, um, and, and the colony was just very weak. Um, so bee imagery creeps into the, the language then. Um, you know, of course, mental health was not considered a, a, a viable reason for not working. Um, this, this concept of depression as an illness was not a 17th century, you know, that's not something that they would have understood. Um, that's not something that happens until much later. Um, so, you know, I think sometimes it's a little unfortunate when you're going back and reading some of these original texts in the 17th and 18th century um, from our standpoint, because I think now as a society, we have more compassion uh, towards people who we have a better understanding about mental illness. Um, we're less likely, I think, to, to stigmatize people as quickly as we used to. And that also applies to people who are poor, or I like to think that we are more compassionate to people who are poor. In the 17th century, remember, you're talking about an English society that was in massive flux 
and trying to deal with overpopulation. Um, the little ice age was happening, so there were a lot of famines. It was not unusual for one town to practically starve to death while another town would do fine simply because the roads were so bad that the towns couldn't share resources. Um, so, so some small towns would be isolated for months um, due to this, what we call the little, the little ice age. Um, you know, there were, there were quite a few events during this time period that not only helped English politicians embrace these new colonies over in North America because it came to be seen as a quick way of, you know, moving people. Um, but you also had weather related events that were also creating real societal issues in England in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so the drone, unfortunately, um, this, this perception that drones are lazy uh, is, is, is one of those that still carries over. Even though most of us in this, on this call know that drones produce a very valuable pheromone. And if we remove drones, you know, the worker bees, the female worker bees get demoralized. They don't want to work, you know, so we need those drones. And obviously, for those of you queen producers that are on this call, you know, you, your queens are only as good as your drones are, you know, so we know that they are, are very important to the biology of the hive, um, you, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Um, so, but, but like I said, we're still, as a society, I think we're still at odds with this. Beekeepers in the know know that drones are important, but we still have a tendency to throw around this, this perception that they are lazy and that they need to be evicted at the end of the year. Um, let's move on, Joe. Let's, um, let's move to another slide. Um, I was just talking about how the, the little ice age and, and historians differ on exactly when it started, but where they are the same is that the 17th and 18th century in Europe was, was at, undoubtedly impacted by unusually cold weather. Now, there are some historians that will move that date of the Little Ice Age back to say the 1300s, um, but, but by the 16th century and 17th centuries, especially the 17th centuries, um, there's just wave after wave of inordinately cold temperatures. So rivers freeze over. Napoleon takes his army out over a frozen river, for instance, um, and also too, kind of hand in hand with this um, is the famine that goes along with prolonged uh, cold periods where, you know, people aren't able to eat. Um, so you have all kinds of rioting happen, happening, especially in France. You know, France is a, is a country that's known for producing tons of, of bread and wheat. And during the ice ages, you have riot, bread riots all the time. Um, some of it has to do with political instability, but, but there's no doubt that the weather played a factor in that. Um, you know, people point to Moscow and Napoleon and the fact that he gets defeated in Moscow in one of the coldest winters in memory, where, where his soldiers froze while they were standing. Um, you know, so, so it's, you know, there's something to that. Um, and, and at least in terms of this particular slide, what I'm wanting to emphasize and what, what Ann Cooperman does so well is how politicians latched onto the natural phenomena of swarming to help resolve overpopulation. So you had a number of people who were being kicked off, you know, peasants uh, who were being kicked off the feudal land congregating in cities, but without a clear path forward, especially women. 
And the thinking is here, what are we going to do with these women or men if they're unemployed and they're standing around, they're just going to riot. England looks over at France constantly, right? The two countries are constantly sizing each other up, even today. And they're terrified that these displaced people will start rioting. So what some of the religious thinkers and the, and, the, and the policymakers do is latch on to this idea of a swarm and say, okay, hives are showing us here how to, how to manage people, how to manage popula overpopulation. You know, what the hive is doing when it gets congested is simply take a group of workers and leave and let the next generation take over. And so then, so there become programs to help help, you know, like I said, displaced peasants, you know, put them on the boat, send them to the colonies. Um, you know, the thinking here is that the colonies will be much easier for them. Um, they don't realize the disease. Um, you know, they don't realize the, the real dangers of these colonists showing up and, and you know, having to deal with Native Americans who are, who are less than thrilled to see them. Um, so the swarm becomes kind of political policy here. It oversimplifies something that was very complex and out of really anyone's control, um, you know, but you had, you had all of this land, at least in the minds of the political thinkers of the time. And so that was, that was seen as the solution. Um, all right, the next slide is taken from Dr. Tom Seeley's The Lives of Bees. And I'm a little bit of, at a disadvantage here because um, Joe's driving the car here and normally I would take my cursor and I would show you the dates that both colonists and bees are making their way here to the States. But the point in this is to show you that from the 17th, Throughout the 17th century, colonists are swarming, right? And, and English politicians say this is a good thing, right? There's a whole swath of propaganda to put this idea that the colonies are an easy place to show up and make a living. And for some peasants, it was exactly exactly what it, it, after difficult years that that's what they had because they had a chance to own land whereas in England if they had stayed it would have been much more difficult because of land ownership rules so so for many many people and especially those colonists that came to Boston the Boston area first, the Massachusetts area first, uh, the Dutch in, in New York, um, you know, this opportunity to own land was kind of dangled in front of them. And for, for them, it was an opportunity that didn't exist with the Jamestown people. The Jamestown colonists were company people first and foremost, um, whereas you know, the pilgrims and the purists who came in and settled in the, in the Northeast um, had that promise of land and working for their family and leaving their family a legacy. So all of those hardships, all of those cold winters, all of that disease, all of that starvation was worth it if they had something at the end of it to leave their children. And so so it was successful, especially, you know, 1644, 1640, um, 1655. That was the worst of that little ice age in England. And you had massive amounts of, of immigrants, not just the English, mind you. Other immigrants, too, are coming over from Europe. But, but, but the image of the swarm is pervasive in English literature at that time. And, and, the, and the ephemeral stuff to the, the flyers. All right, let's move on. So they're bringing 
um, bees with them. And they're also bringing their traditions of how honey, hunt, honey hunting was reflected in European traditions. And, and, and it looks remarkably similar. You know, I am from Eastern Kentucky and, um, you know, if I had my cursor and maybe Joe would be so kind as to circle that bear down there, there are two bears. Um, this is one of our big threats right now in Eastern Kentucky. Um, you know, if a beekeeper doesn't set up a bear proof fence before the hives are set up, you can forget it. I mean, once those bears lock in to where those hives are, it doesn't matter how high you build that wall, those bears will get over it. Um, and the, you know, the England, the English colonists were taking of what they were finding in the trees and bee gum becomes a popular term that they use amongst themselves because the black gum tree, there were, there were tons of black gum trees in North America that would decay from the interior and, and the bees did better than the settlers did. Uh, that's a point that every historian agrees on. The bees were fine. There were plenty of trees, you know, there were plenty of decaying um, interiors that they could swarm into. And so, um, it, you know, for honey hunters, especially from Germany um, and, and the Russian forest based areas, this, this is what they knew. Um, skeps tend to be more from Germany, but if uh, Joe, you could circle the skep down there, that becomes a per pervasive symbol among settlers. You got to think about how many uh, different different countries are sending settlers to the colonies at this point in time, and so I think for many people, you know, this these symbols here replace language, and they suggest stability, and they suggest community and working together in a very clear um, caste system that will benefit everyone. So let's move on. The next slide is taken from Dorothy Galton's. And this is showing how Russian beekeepers um, harvest their honey. And for those of you who are interested in the International Bee Congress, Apomondia, um, it was supposed to happen in 2021 in the, I can't say the, the, the Russian word for the city, um, but the short word, for the region is UFA, U-F-A, even I can pronounce that. Um, so it's um, because of COVID, obviously not going to happen. They have, they have postponed Epimondia and UFA until 2022. But for those of you who are travelers, you may want to put, it's in September, you may want to put this date on your calendar. This will be a unique uh, time to see a type of beekeeping that most of us don't see anymore. And they are featuring, the Apomondia organizers are featuring this unique type of honey hunting and honey harvesting. And so I just wanna put that on your radar screen um, that in 2022, um, Russia will be hosting the International Apomondia Bee Congress and they will be focusing on forest-based beekeeping. So let's move on to the next slide in which I'm focusing on gums. And uh, my first year as the state apiarist, I got a call from Harlan County, which is where I was born. Uh, this beekeeper still keeps hives in gums because our state does not say you can't keep bees in gums. Most states, have restrictions. You know, they require beekeepers to have movable frame hives so that you as a beekeeper can go in and check and make sure that the hive isn't suffering from a disease. You can check to see if it's queen right. Well, <laughs> I, I went down uh, to Harlan County and what I did was I uh, had a headlamp and uh, I had a magnifying glass. And, uh, and so he was very kind, he held up the gum so I could look up underneath it. Uh, and our big thing here, I didn't want to, you know, chastise him for keeping his hives and gums because I, I thought that the communication was more important 
Um, especially because, like I said, I had no legal leg to stand on. Uh, there wasn't anything in the KRS statute that said he couldn't have guns. Um, but I really did want him, if he noticed that there were uh, foul brood issues, I wanted him to feel comfortable enough that he could he could reach out to me. Um, but I think that's unusual for a state APRs to have this in the first month that um, he or she is on the job. And I just thought you, because you're in Texas, you may not have guns, uh, but I just wanted you to realize that people still do this. You know, it's hundreds of years old and people are still keeping hives this way. All right, let's move on. The next slide is of a skep that someone donated to my program. Uh, this skep is 19th century Germany. Um, it's made from rye that's woven together. People liked skeps because they could be transportable between cities. Um, you know, you could use them over and over again. Um, they, um, I, I, I've seen several different styles, but this one is especially sturdy. Uh, seventh graders like it when I talk about the fact that after it's woven, then the beekeeper would take cow dung and smooth the cracks and stuff. And so that always gets a nice uh, round of oohs and ohs, I don't want to touch that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, these are beekeepers are resourceful people and these skeps that were developed use the land and, and its resources. And I just um, wanted to, to show you uh, that, that, of course, they still exist. They are a little, in my opinion, uh, more beautiful than some of the newer models that garden centers have, which, you know, I think is, is more for show. All right, let's move to the next slide. My point in, in talking about these different styles is to emphasize something that I think we tend to forget, that in the 17th and the 18th century, first of all, it is not foreordained that there will be a United States. You know, you have to consider how many settlers are coming from Europe. You have the English, you have the French, who were, who were you know, going up and down the Mississippi. They were coming into Canada. The Dutch were settling what became New York. Um, the Spanish were, were uh, in Florida and Louisiana. Um, the Germans, of course, were coming into Pennsylvania in, in, in massive waves, and you had indigenous people who were already here and had been here for, for centuries. Um, so, you know, with this, all of this influx of different peoples, different cultures, different currencies even, I mean, this is a time when before you have paper currency, most of your currency, if it's anything, is going to be coin currency. And even, you know, the Indian people, the Native American people had their currency, the wampum. And so the, the skep lended itself, I think, to a way of, of, of suggesting stability in the midst of all of these peoples. And I think we still hold on to it. Um, we can go to the next slide, which is, I think to me, one of the more interesting slides. Um, Benjamin Franklin had to convince uh, the Continental Congress that paper money could be a good thing. Um, I mean, if like, again, for him, it's about getting everybody on the same page, right? Uh, you have all of these different currencies. You have, you have all of these different cultures. So for him, uh, this is the 1979 um, Continental Congress uh, and, it's, and it has, uh, Joe, can you put your pointer over the skeps? They're underneath a shed here. It's a very Irish looking kind of setup here. And it's too minute for us to do it in this particular presentation. But Benjamin Franklin was very proud of this design. Um, he was also very proud if you look on the sides and in the center, um, if it has the red uh, marking that you see there, that's red wax. 
And this is your way of knowing that this particular $45 bill is not counterfeited because the British had a field day with this. All right, the Redcoats you know, heard about the fact that the Continental Congress was gonna issue this paper money and they started issuing counterfeit money right and left. Driving, it was economic warfare. Um, it drove the value down of this real $45 note, you know, down to almost nothing practically. But, um, you know, it was this country's first way of setting up its own economy. And um, let's go to the next slide, make sure I don't miss anything. That's one of the more interesting things, I think. Um, oh, yes, each scap has 13 rings so that each ring symbolizes a colony. Uh, like I said, that's a little difficult to do in this particular format. Uh, but then the thing that came out of it, like I said, was that the British were, were producing so much counterfeit uh, paper money that there's this phrase called not worth a continental uh, because inflation was definitely a problem. It was difficult to get soldiers paid what they were really worth. Um, let's move on. There were other things that came from beekeeping that shaped how we went about our social activities. The 18th century in particular co-opted the image um, for their social activities, the sewing bees, the quilting bees. I put corn husking bees here because I'm, I was afraid that maybe people in this audience, if I just put husking bee, wouldn't know what husking is anymore because I think some people have never had to husk corn. Um, I grew up husking corn. I grew up canning corn. So that's familiar to me. But I think many people now, I'm dating myself, you know, I'm in my 50s. And I think many people now never shuck an ear of corn, for instance. Um, but the one thing I think that all of us do recognize is, is the spelling bee, the script spelling bee. Um, that's, that's something that still remains. Uh, and that's, that's something straight from our founding days uh, is this, um, you know, a way of entertaining oneself without internet, without television, without, you know, telephones, you know, well, how do you entertain yourself? Well, the spelling bee is a perfectly good way of having a lot of fun uh, and also learning something. And we still, we still, we still honor our champions uh, on this. All right, let's move on. The, the next slide has us moving into some of these technological advances. I think the 19th century is interesting because, you know, practically within a 20 year period, practically, the, you have these four major inventions in beekeeping and we're still using all of them. And I can't think of another industry where that's the case still, you know, like for instance, you know, there's, you know, the car industry, has, is not like this at all. <laughs> you know, we don't use wagons and horses anymore. Um, so we have the movable frame hive, which Lorenzo Langstroth designed using this concept of bee space. Um, his book comes out in 1853. And from then on, beekeepers have a way of managing their hives. And so we move completely away from skeps and, and bee gums or can, we can move. Beekeepers have a choice now. Uh, smoker designs are much better. And if you haven't had um, Wyatt Mangum talk about smokers, fascinating discussion. Um, please consider it. You'll, you'll, never, you'll never take your smoker for granted again. And while I'm at it, I'll just go on and say for, for my money, I'm always going to buy a bigger smoker with a larger chimney. I think that they are easier to light and they stay lit longer. Uh, honey extractors, now we no longer use the wooden ones here. Um, this was a design, though, by an Austrian who, um, you know, used, he was watching his son, um, you know, play with a toy. And the toy required centrifugal force. And so he just took that concept, that, phys that physics concept and adapted it uh, to this, this uh, particular invention. And we still use honey extractors. Um, and the comb wax foundation, 
machinery was all within a 20 year period. All four of these are happening and they set up the backbone of the commercial beekeeping industry. And, we, and we're still dependent upon all of them. Uh, haven't been able, I don't think, to improve on any of them. Um, let's move forward. I will say that for, for my money, um, the next thing is a smoker. Um, and I, what I wanted you to see here too, this is from Takabishi's on Facebook. There is a queen who is flying into this. And like I said, if I had my, if I had my, uh, now we're going to test Joe to see his queen spotting skills, which is most unfair. I should not have done this, but it's right below down south, south, south. Good. Almost. You were right over her. She's on that um, metal bar, the second metal bar from the top. There you go, right there. Good job, Joe. Good job. That's, that's pressure, in my opinion. If you can see a queen like that, I'm impressed. <laughs> but the smoke, so the smoker technology improves. Um, it, the next slide is just sh showing you what the initial comb wax foundation presses look like. Um, for people who have been worried about pesticides in their beeswax foundation sheets, they are starting to go back to some of these earlier comb wax foundations and make them their own. Um, I, when I worked in the queen bee industry in Hawaii, um, there was a man who would use he had a huge vat where he would melt his beeswax and then he would use layers of cardboard to make his own foundation because he was trying to be as organic as possible. And so I think that, you know, there may be some, you know, some advances, maybe some innovations in this, but you've got people who are, who are going back to the playing book on when it comes to comb wax foundation. And again, it's because simply you can't buy wax foundation from a bee supply company that doesn't have at least some residuals of, of, of agricultural products in it. And, um, and I understand that. One of the things that my husband did when we got married uh, in next slide, Joe, is to basically move us away from woodenware equipment and now, um, you know, standardize all of our equipment so that we use polystyrene. Um, you know, everything is six frame six frames polystyrene deeps and that has has made an enormous difference and I, I get no kickbacks from blue sky supply but I do want to encourage you I know that this is not a how-to presentation but I'm just sliding that in there that this is if if you have trouble lifting heavy equipment heavy woodenware or you have back problems uh, this it's it's six frames, you know, when it's pulled out on both sides in the middle of July, it's still heavy. It's still plenty heavy, but it's really made an enormous difference for us. And then, of course, I'm still in the 19th century. So the next slide is just showing you that when the nation was struggling in the Civil War, people were still using the honeybee uh, to unite and uh, this is an example of a flag that uh, was used by the 72nd Pennsylvania. And um, I, again, it's just, just again suggesting how pervasive this symbol was and, and still is, but um, it moves us towards the 20th century. So let's move to the next slide. The 20th century differs from all of the others in that um, <laughs> your secretary is on it. I just want to give a shout out to the secretary. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the 20th century differs from all the others because the United States, first of all, becomes the first industrial agriculture nation. What that means, unfortunately, is that bees become the stepchildren of agriculture. And why do I say that? Well, because what happens then is large-scale monoculture and, and 
the, the chemical products industry kind of go hand in hand, right? You can't have acres and acres and acres of almonds without, because biology just wouldn't allow it. There would be pests of some kind and there are. Um, and so the, the, chemical chemis, the chemical industry evolved hand in hand with monocultural industry. And for most crops that don't require pollination, say corn, soybeans, those are the ones that come to mind. You don't have to have pollination. So it's no big deal. Um, almonds, change, that's a different, you know, they require pollination. But this to me is the 20th century is really when, when the symbols of bees and bees themselves begin to get kind of shoved to the side a little bit. Um, and there are these other factors that I'll let you read for yourselves. Two world wars, um, you know, I think ironically, some of our best beekeepers were, were people who profited from the United States um, military complex. I mean, in the First World War, they absolutely had to have honey and beeswax, both of those commodities. So they would, they would let people stay home just to be beekeepers. That's how important it was, right? By World War II, that becomes less so of a need, and there's less emphasis on the government's, um, you know, taking us, making a, a concentration concentrated effort to educate beekeepers like it did in the First World War. But there's still some amazing beekeepers that come out of the, the, the social engineering that happened in the World Wars when it comes to, uh, to beekeeping. Let's move to the second slide because there is where I really began to define the industrial agriculture. I'm using a, a writer for those historians here um, a writer named Stephen Stoll's Larding the uh, Fruits of Natural Advantage. I think Stephen Stoll is like one of the best historians um, writing about the U.S. And in Fruits of Natural Advantage, he kind of breaks down agriculture in these five different, um, um, all of these things, they're not, one is not more important than the other. They're all equally important. But what I want you to notice about this slide is that there's, that, that again, bees here are the stepchildren. You know, what gets lost here is, you know, how central beekeeping had been to agriculture and still is. Um, but state universities like Texas A&M, you all rock, you know, I, I mean, I just think that the, I, I serve on the foundation for the preservation of honeybees and the, the, the grant applications that we get from Texas A&M students are just, just second to none. And, you know, state universities also are doing research. You know, you're not just educating, you're doing research. You're looking at problems. You're pushing the envelope. The federal government, we have four USDA B labs. We used to have eight, you know, but now we have four and they are pushing the envelopes in terms of, you know, uh, looking at genetics at, at the Baton Rouge lab or looking at nutrition at the Arizona lab. Um, unique land opportunities like California, like Texas. Um, you know, when you have these unique land opportunities or Hawaii, if you're going to raise queens or coffee, you can, you get, you can set up monocultural cropping. This is unheard of in history on the scale that the U.S. does in the 20th century and the 21st century. Exploitable labor, um, you know, used to be farmers would use their families as the exploitable labor. I can, I can vouch for this. I grew up on a pig farm. I grew up slopping the hogs. <laughs> That's how I earned the money for my first car. Um, of course, you know, in the United States, we have other you know, exploitable labor has been used um, to also uh, dominate people too. And that's been, um, you know, the, the unfortunate side of the industrial countryside. Uh, chemical products, I've just now talked about that. And like I said, in all of Stephen Stoll's fine analysis of this, he leaves out pollination and how central it is to the apple industry. Well, not 
I mean, 93 crops in the U.S. depend upon pollination, strawberries, you know, melons, pumpkins, all, all of that. So I've often wondered, like, if he would ever reconsider this in, in the light of that. But uh, for those of you who, who are interested in agricultural history, this is a good read. Um, of course, in the 20th century, the next slide, um, US, U.S. beekeepers get hit, and we get hit hard by this varroa mite because we had a shallow genetic gene pool based on this 1922 honeybee import ban. And I just want you to see, like I said, oh boy, I'm at a real disadvantage here. Okay, I was gonna take my cursor and show you where the Primorsky K region is, which is, which is um, above North Korea, obviously to the west of Sapapur of Japan. Yeah, there you go, Joe, we're getting there, right? It's Primorsky Cray, Russia. That's where this mite comes from. It had evolved hand in hand with the Apis serrana, you know, millions of years. Um, and the Apis serrana, of course, has its own defenses against this varroa mite. Um, but by the time it gets to the states, the varroa mite, our, the honeybees in the states have no resistance whatsoever, and it really decimates uh, many commercial beekeeping populations. Like I said, I know that this isn't a varroa mite presentation, but it is one of the game changers of beekeeping in the United States. And to quote Shimanuki, you know, good beekeepers got better, bad beekeepers got out. And as, as harsh as that sounds, I think that one phrase still sums it up. Let's move on. Not only are we dealing with that. Yeah, there we go. That's just kind of where Joe was showing us here. Uh, that host pathogen transfer probably, probably just happened once, you know, but, but beekeepers here in the States are still dealing with this. The other invasion, <laughs> I call it invasion, biological invasion, um, is in the next slide where we get not just African honeybees coming up from South America, uh, they arrive in the 1990s, but we also get the small hive beetle, uh, which is arriving from Africa. And I just want to, again, encourage your association to reach out to Izzy Hill I think many people feel like um, they have to use a chemical uh, like Kumafos to control small hive beetle. Izzy Hill does a great presentation on nematodes, which are a biocontrol of small hive beetle. So the next slide shows you what nematodes can look like. Yeah, there we go. The nematodes are over, obviously, they're the things that look like spaghetti. And you know, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to apply them. But basically, um, the nematodes enter the orifices of the pupae and of the small hive beetle pupae, this is. And once inside, they decompose. And when they are effective, the small hive beetle pupae will turn a color of pink so that you know that it's working. So if we look at the next slide, what you can see is this discoloration that happens when um, they turn color. And you are seeing over here on the right-hand side, we are applying nematodes to the grass so that it's a, a fairly um, simple application. You don't have to have gloves. You don't have to have chemical eyewear, safety eyewear, things like that. The next slide is a source for the nematodes. Um, just so that you know where to reach out. And there are good videos on how this works. For those of you who are looking for something to control small hive beetles that don't require, um, like I said, harsh chemicals. Um, the other thing that happens as we move into the 21st century, the next slide, um, is that the fragility of our agricultural complex becomes apparent, um, you know, colony collapse disorder it gets named in 2006. And finally, there's a lot more federal farm bill funds. Um, 
you know, in 2015, state pollinator protection plans were asked of states. Um, you know, Dr. Samuel Ramsey started working more with varroa mites and learning exactly how they do their damage. So the next slide um, is just a, 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 sh a shot. If those of you who are interested in the Honeybee Health Survey, if you go to the Bee Informed Partnership and click on state reports, you can click on your state and you can click on the year and you can keep up to date with the viruses and nosema. Um, not every state participates. I think right now we're up to 40 out of the 50 states, but I think many people don't even realize that this data exists. Um, the next slide is again, we're still talking analogies. Another one that's still pervasive is the queen bee analogy. And again, I'm dating myself, but for those of you who really want to get into this, Allie McBeal did this great, um, it's, a, it's a great episode where uh, two women are fighting over a guy, a, a reverend, and uh, they have a sing out. Both women are equally gifted in, um, in being able to project their voices. Um, and this plays on this idea here that women are competitive and they will fight until the other one dies. And so I just wanted to, to um, you know, send you that way if, if, you're, if you enjoy these kinds of things. But the next slide is just to suggest that there's still a lot that we don't know about queen biology. Uh, this particular slide on the left is showing a mother and a daughter both occupying the same frame in the same hive. You know, there's still there's still a lot of mystery there, uh, but clearly they are not locked into a deadly battle. Um, eventually it may, it probably does. I know that it will happen, but uh, you know, there's a lot there. That I think that this happens more than what we realize and um, that we just don't happen to have a camera when we see it. If any of you have seen a hatch, hatch out, you know, you'll see four or five queens, you know, and, and some of them will hide, some of them will go cluster in the corner, and some of them will go out to the front and begin the, to take an after swarm perhaps. Um, but there's still a lot that we don't know about queen biology and, um, and I think sometimes, it, you know, this, this idea that, that women um, are, are super competitive to the point that we will kill each other holds us back. I, I, I still think that. Um, and the next slide is just a general slide talking about looking at how women have changed farming um, in the past 10 years. This, this information from USDA is from 2015. Um, and so we're making a $12 billion impact. Um, and, and so hopefully we're chipping away at this perception that women don't play well with others. And you've got two very fine uh, leaders there in your state. I'm, um, the next slide is gonna just quickly, you know, look at Jennifer Berry and Marla um, and um, this is names just escaping me. Um, but then your next slide is Mary and Juliana Rangel, um, who um, obviously uh, just do fine work and work well with a lot of people. Um, state pollinator protection plans, I think, are one of the things that this century uh, is working with. It's one of the first times we've seen it. And then of course we have the Asian giant hornet knocking on our door. That's our next slide. Um, you know, Asian giant hornets of course have been called the murder hornets. Um, I think that's a little overblown. I had been trapping for Asian giant hornets for two years and had never heard of the phrase murder hornet, but they did arrive in, you know, um, December of 2019. In 2020, Washington Department of Ag made that its top priority and Congress devoted uh, quite a bit of funds to help Washington track down um, that tree. The next slide is just a, to show you uh, that they did find the tree. Um, this is the world's largest insect. They have come out with a documentary 
of their effort. And I think it's supposed to be available like maybe this week. Um, and so Joe, if you could move to slide 40. Yeah, there is um, the Washington Department of Ag. Uh, they, they will give you that information about the documentary if you want. Um, I mentioned this trapping that I've been doing. The USDA has put aside money for the native bee and wasp survey. So slide 41 shows what that looks like. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I just want you to see uh, <laughs> attack of the murder hornets. So this um, jug that is hanging on the tree bough to my right, it's filled with a bait. Very simple technology. Um, as many citizens in Washington state have been offering to do this to help the Department of Ag um, see if there are any more Asian giant hornet colonies in their area. Um, on the back, I would say kind of there's a pole with a yellow a ribbon and a blue vein trap right there and that collects native bees. And I participate in this so that my state can begin to get a baseline of native bee diversity, which like I said, Congress this particular century has been putting money towards. Um, and so the next slide 42, and I promise we're almost finished, is just a, a snapshot of what that inventory looks like. Um, and so finally, the on slide 43, our last analogy, <laughs> I promise. Um, I, like, I like Tom Seeley's, all of his works, but um, in Honeybee Democracy, he ends with, uh, a, a swarm analogy, he calls it swarm smarts. And he compares his English, um, his entomology department to a New England small town meeting. And I just thought it was a nice way to conclude this, this presentation um, because there's some ground rules that operate. And so sometimes analogies are what we call false analogies. Um, and some of them are, are quite accurate and I think I wanted to end with one that I think is accurate and that I hope um, helps associations uh, negotiate some of the difficult things in front of us. And that is that, you know, it's open and fair competition of ideas. Just as scout bees have to <clears throat> go in search of good homes and they have to advertise and recruit to find a good home, because only one in every four swarms will survive. So the scout bees, it's really on them. It's really on them to be able to communicate. And, and that requires good communication among all members and that it's important to be flexible. It's more important to be flexible sometimes I think than it is to be right. As difficult as a hard-headed hillbilly has to say, it's, I've, I've found it in my 50s that, that, that there's some truth to that. So my next slide is, is the resources I used. I always like to point people to, to the materials that I used. Um, and uh, the, the final one is my contact. And, you know, I know that it's late. Uh, I'm, I apologize for my my difficulties in joining you tonight. Again, I express my appreciation to Joe for being willing to uh, kind of drive us through this presentation. Thank you, Tammy. So um, beekeepers on the phone, what questions do you have for Tammy? Um, you're welcome to unmute and ask those or um, put them in the chat. And if Joe is so kind, uh, share any questions. All right, getting there to the chat. Don't see any questions yet. Somebody did ask if this site, if this will be shared and yes, we will share this. 
being recorded mm -hmm. will be shared on our um, Kyle can tell us how we're going to share that. Mm -hmm. Um, question. Um, about the hornets, could the hornets get from all the way from Washington to Houston or no? A good question. The Washington Department of Ag is working diligently to find all of the colonies that they can. They have destroyed, they, they found one and they have destroyed it. They destroyed it, they think, days before there were queen hornets ready to emerge. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, the, the, the prognosis right now that they could escape Washington State, um, you know, you've got some people predicting that they won't, they won't arrive, say, in Kentucky or, or, or Texas for at least, you know, 30 years. Um, but I can tell you that the Washington Department of Ag is, is, is working very hard and, and the whole army of citizens have, have offered to put out those traps that I was showing you. Like I said, it's not expensive technology. Um, so they are trying to contain, if there are other colonies, they're trying to contain them there in the upper um, northern part of Washington state. Um, so, so there are a lot of people who are working really hard so that they won't reach Texas. But I can't, I can't make any promises. Uh, nematodes control for the uh, small hive beetles, Tammy. Are there different types of nematodes? Yes. Question. Yes, nematodes, uh, there are, are many types of nematodes. And so that's one reason why I have directed you to um, the southeastern ne nectaries. And, and if you choose to follow up on this, make sure that if you call, for instance, or if you email, uh, make sure that, that you say that you're a beekeeper. Uh, this is a person who has a ton of experience working with beekeepers. And um, some, some people are not quite as ethical when they are selling nematodes, and it, but this man is. And he's worked with Dr. Izzy Hill, who is, you know, she kind of, she's the bee czar at EPA. Uh, he's worked with her a long time. And uh, she has never, ever had a problem with him. So uh, that's one reason why I'm recommending him. And, I, and if you haven't heard her nematode talk, it's really fascinating. What was her name again, Tammy? Izzy Hill. I think okay. Izzy is short for Elizabeth. And I think probably her, her work email is Elizabeth Hill, but she is known as Izzy. Okay. So I had a question myself. That picture of the fellow up in the tree, the Russian, who looked like he was going to go up there and look at a hive. Was he actually going to try to collect honey from a beehive while he's climbing a tree? I, that picture is from Dorothy Galton's A Thousand Years of Russian Bee History, I think. And I think at that point, he was just checking the hive. I don't think he was going to harvest honey. But, but it's my understanding that the Apomondia that will be scheduled in Ufa is in September so that they can demonstrate how to, how to harvest honey from, from those trees. That would be great to be able to go. I did go to the one that was in Canada a few years ago, and it was amazing. It was a really a great conference. I know. I I have you know to wrap my head around what it would take to get because <laughs> it's right on to, if uh, Russia is right on top of uh, Kazakhstan, you know, or uh -huh. you know, it's right on top of you know, it, it's not. I'm not going to be on the coast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I just haven't 
I haven't figured out if I'm going to try to make that or not, but I would love, I would absolutely love to see that. Yeah. Tammy, I had a question. You know, um, I love your approach in this kind of mix of, uh, you know, history and beekeeping. What brought you to write this book and put this together? It was the book that I wanted to read, you know, Mm. and and I couldn't find it. And so I just decided to write it Mm -hmm. Uh, it, because I I thought to me anyway, that in our country, poverty is a sin and, and it's, uh, and I wanted to explore that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, one of the reasons our safety net is so porous it 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 doesn't it goes back to the 17th century and it, it, so I, I'm not about pointing fingers at one political party or another because it just goes further back it goes so far back that if you don't understand you know those colonists who show up in Jamestown and have to work have to figure out how they're going to survive and you've got captain smith using language in any kind of way to encourage people just to get out of bed and make it happen you know i think you you just you know i think you have to understand how difficult that was at that period in time and that it and it, and it worked you know we're here because it worked in some ways So, um, you know, I think the pandemic is a leveling factor in in a lot of ways. I think it forces us to to go back to the drawing board. I'm obviously, uh, you know, it's it's heartbreaking to see our nation and the world suffer this way. But I think it helps us deal with some things that we've simplified for a long time. Hey, uh, Tammy, this is Mark here. I've got a historical question. I have heard uh, that the Native Americans um, had uh, referred to the European honeybee as the white man's flies. I, can you verify if you come across that? So there are two sources for that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, in his notes on Virginia and uh, Longfellow is the other one that that makes reference to how Native American people refer to the honeybee. Um, so those are the two references, and, and I can and I could see why they consider it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it you you've got th- this issue hasn't gone away. I mean, people are still talking about. Um, you know, honeybees as an invasive uh, insect and, um, you know, the fact that it's naturalized is, um, you know, something that people who are proponents of native bees really struggle with. Um, And gosh, if you look at our agricultural industry, I mean, almonds, you know, or, you know, I mean, these are things that are, um, we'd have to really apples you know these are things that we'd have to kind of think about I don't know to to me the United States has always been able to feed its people and the world and so um, that's a point of pride Um, but it's something to to consider and the 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 conversations are, are are happening even now I have a question. Um, you said that the when the queen bees die, um, like no, you were saying that there was two queen bees. Um, can you verify like that they wouldn't attack and they'll still and that they'll still be there? Like they won't kill each other. So what what happens? what we know happens anyway, is that when a hive becomes too congested, that can be unhealthy, right? It's like if, if you have too many people living in one room, 
right? Then bacteria spreads more easily. Uh, people get fussy with each other more easily. It can, it can be unhealthy. And so the hive begins then to, to prepare to swarm. And the mother queen will lay eggs in queen cells and the workers will draw those queen cells out. And there is communication that happens. Uh, there is piping, the queen pipes. Um, you know, when a scout bee is, the scouts pipe for that matter. Um, they're constantly communicating, you know, in terms of how they're gonna time this because uh, bees have to warm up their wings. They can't just say, all right, we are going to fly and we're going to fly, you know, say a mile away. You know, they have to warm up. They have to eat some honey and get some energy. And she does too. She has to lose weight, for instance. Um, so there's timing that has to go on. And so immediately before the, the queen in the cells emerge, um, you know, again, you know, the, the mother queen will take her, her swarm, actually the scout bees take the swarm and the, and the mother queen and they leave typically, but sometimes it's raining outside, right? And so the, the mother queen can't leave. And so she, they, she begins to pipe and the virgins will also pipe back. In other words, those queens that are in the cell, they will communicate. And some of it is, you know, hey, stay in your cell. The other is, uh, you know, researchers are still figuring out what they're saying to each other. But what we know is that um, it is not uncommon for a mother and a daughter or daughters to inhabit some of that space for a while, a short while. Some of those daughters queens will leave and take some bees with them. They will go on and swarm. But sometimes the mother, um, you know, if it waits too long, if, the, if, if, if too much time passes, inevitably there has to be a point where there is just one queen. It may be that the mother queen can take her, you know, can leave with the swarm and then she can leave the dominant queen the young queen behind. Um, it may be that two virgins will, will tussle and, and only one remains alive, but there's a lot we don't know on, on this question of two queens sharing space. Um, to me, that's, that's one of the next big research questions that young people, we need young people to, to look at because it's certainly fascinating. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for the question. I love seeing I love seeing pictures where there are two queens and sometimes more. I love I love seeing a hatch out and seeing three and four. I mean, one time I was with my husband and and I caught three queens on the front of our hive. You know, oh my God. and if and if he hadn't been there to verify, you know, I don't think anyone would have believed me. <laughs> But, but when you, or if you're looking at a huge swarm, I've caught four, four virgin queens in a huge mm -hmm. swarm before. So I think that there's a lot that we don't know and, yeah. and that that's a good thing. I agree. All I think, right. So I think we'll wrap up our questions for today. But if anyone has any other questions, feel free to send them in to um, uh, HoustonBeekeepers.org, and we'll definitely make sure that Tammy uh, gets, them, um, gets them answered and back to us. But I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Tammy. It was a wonderful topic and um, really lovely to hear your passion and this history uh, combined with our passion of beekeeping. So we so appreciate you joining us today. Well, thank you for your patience. I, I appreciate your patience <laughs> and I appreciate Joe's uh, patience too. Absolutely. No Joe's a superstar today for both of us. <laughs> 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 oh gosh. 
All right. So the last uh, to do for our meeting today is our virtual door prizes. And today we are giving away three of Tammy's books. So Kyle, do you want to pick the winners? Oh, uh, I think I'm picking or, the winners. Or Joe. Or Joe, whoever's picking the winners. <laughs> I used, uh, during the break there, I used my trusty random generator, random number generator, and uh, picked uh, picked a bunch of numbers. And so let's make sure to see people who are here. So the first winner is Ann Reynolds, and I see she's still on. So Ann, you good to go with uh, winning a book? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Second winner is Theophane Polydoros. He's still on. Oh no, he dropped off. Okay, uh, so he's off. Check. Next winner, Gerald Grise, G R I E S or Grise. Gerald, you here? Yep. Gary. Gerald still. <laughs> I see. I saw. I know he's still on. I don't hear. Him. I'm here. There okay. you go. <laughs> find Couldn't find you on mood. <laughs> All right. And our third winner is uh, Jason. Let's see. I can't read my own read. It's like uh, Fuxa, F U X A. <laughs> yeah, you pronounce it right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jason Fuxa. All right. Good job, Joe. <laughs> all right great well uh joe will coordinate with you guys to get you um the books and um our next meeting is actually going to come up quick as you remember this was rescheduled since february so we will still have our next meeting on march 16th and we will have James and Sherry Elam here to talk about the annual management of the backyard beekeeper. So all the things we do throughout the year to support our honeybees. And um, if you remember, they are from Texas Bee Supply. And um, it's been a little over a year since they um, presented for us. So we're really excited to have them. Anything else, Joe, that we need to share before we wrap up? I think that's it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. And thank you, Tammy, for joining us. Everyone be safe out there and can't wait to see you on our next meeting. Thank you all. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.